when people in the West first learned about Buddhism, especially in the 20th century, there were a lot of psychotherapists who complained. The Buddha teaches there's no self, but people need to have a healthy sense of self in order to survive, in order to be healthy, happy individuals. But they had a misunderstanding on two counts. One is the Buddha never taught that there is no self. He just taught that there are things that we tend to identify with which cause suffering and we'd be better off if we let go of them, if we didn't identify with them. His teaching was not self, not no self. And as an important first step, he taught all the basic principles that modern psychologists now say contribute to a healthy self. He had them a couple thousand years ago. There are five qualities that modern psychologists point to. The first one is anticipation. In other words, you realize that there are dangers facing you. And if you have a healthy sense of self, you'll prepare for those dangers. You realize that you have the ability to make preparations, and you don't want to let the opportunity pass. Well, the Buddha teaches us. In fact, he says it's the basis for all skillful qualities. It's heedfulness, realizing that we do face dangers in life, some of them from inside, some of them from outside. But we can prepare. We can protect ourselves from those dangers through the power of our actions. The second principle is altruism. When you take the well-being of other people into consideration, because you realize that your well-being is going to have to depend on at least to some extent, on their well-being as well. Here again, the Buddha teaches this. He calls it compassion. Compassion comes from heedfulness. There's a story in the canon. A king and a queen are in, alone in their apartment, and in a tender moment the king turns to the queen and says, Is there anyone you love more than yourself? Now you know what he's probably thinking. He wants her to say, Yes, Your Majesty, I love you more than I love myself. And if there are, this were a Hollywood movie, that's probably what she's saying. But this is the Pali Canon. And the Queen, Malika, is no fool. She says, no, there's nobody I love more than myself. How about you? Is there anyone you love more than yourself? The King has to admit that no, there's nobody he loves more than himself. So that's the end of that scene. So the King goes down to see the Buddha, tells him what had happened, and the Buddha says, you know, she's right. You could search the whole world over and never find anyone that you love more than yourself. In the same way, other beings, other people, love themselves just as fiercely. And so the Buddha's conclusion is that you should never harm anyone and never cause them to do any harm. In other words, think of their happiness, think of what would cause them true happiness, and work for that. Keep that in mind. Because after all, if your happiness depends on their suffering, or they're doing unskillful things, they're not going to stand for it. They're going to resent it and try to do what they can to destroy your happiness. So for happiness that lasts, if you really are heedful, you have to have compassion for all beings. That's the sign of a healthy self. Then there's the principle of suppression, realizing that you have some unskillful attitudes, some unskillful urges that come up in the mind. And if you give in to them, it's going to cause trouble. So you learn how to say no. Well, in Buddhism we have this too. The Buddha teaches restraint. Anything you would do, say, or think that would cause harm, you learn how to say no. But you don't just stop with no. And here again, both psychology and the Buddhist teachings tell you what to do in their term. The psychologist's term is sublimation. We learn how to find pleasure some other way, so you're not just feeling frustrated. In the Buddhist teachings, we don't have a term for that, but the Buddha does talk about taking a delight in being on the path. When you're generous, think about what a good thing it is to be generous. When you observe the precepts, you think about how happy you are that you're not causing the kind of trouble that gets caused when you break the precepts. And when you meditate, the Buddha says, breathe in a way that gives rise to a rapture, breathe in a way that gives rise to pleasure. Train yourself to do this, so you can find happiness inside. And finally, the fifth 
principle that the psychologists talk about is having a sense of humor. You learn how to laugh at your foibles. That's a healthy self. The people who can't laugh at themselves, they take themselves too seriously, they're too proud. They're headed for a fall. Well, but it doesn't talk about humor so much, but he does show instances of humor. There was that time when he compared Brahmins to dogs, and the dogs came out better. As he said in the old days, Brahmins didn't handle money and dogs didn't handle money. Nowadays you find Brahmins who do handle money, but dogs still don't handle money. In the old days, Brahmins would mix only with Brahmins and not with non-Brahmins. Nowadays, nowadays they find all kinds of people. In the old days, dogs would not mix with non-dogs, and today they still don't mix with non-dogs. So the Buddha did have, a, did have a sense of humor. What's most important, of course, is when you are meditating and you're faced with your defilements. If you learn how to laugh at them, see that your lust is pretty ridiculous, your anger is pretty stupid. It's a lot easier to get past these things when you can laugh at them. And finally, there's a quality that the Buddhists talk about. But the psychologists don't, and that's having a healthy sense of shame. For the psychologist, shame means one thing, is being embarrassed about something other people look down on you for. It's the opposite of pride. But, but there's another kind of shame, which is the opposite of shamelessness. Shamelessness is when you don't care what other people think, you're just going to do what you want to do. You don't care what their opinion they have of you. Well, the Buddha actually encourages a sense of shame in that sense. He says you want to look good in the eyes of the noble ones. That kind of shame is a healthy sense of self because it spurs you to do the things that you know are right. And you don't have to carry around that sense of the very offensive sense that I don't care what other people think. That's not healthy. So the Buddha does teach you how to have a sense, healthy sense of self. As he says, the self is its own mainstay, atahi atano nato. That's going to be your mainstay only if you train it. If it's not trained, you can't really depend on yourself. But if you do train it, then you can depend. This is a really important principle throughout the teachings. You have to keep depending on yourself. The Buddha teaches you, as he says, the whole of the holy life is to have it admirable friends and to engage in admirable friendship, which means that you look for good people. And not only that, whatever they have is good qualities, you try to emulate their good qualities. So in that sense you're, you're dependent on them, but it's up to you to emulate their qualities. They can't do it for you. Years back when I was taking the Dharma exams in Thailand, one of the exams involves writing a little Dharma talk. They give you a, a quote from the canon, and they want you to talk about that topic, and then bring in, in the first year they ask you to bring in one quote, second year two quotes, the third year three quotes, Pali and Thai. And they give you a book full of short quotes from the Buddhist teachings, and they expect you to memorize it. I remember when I was studying for the exam, the idea of the novices just memorizing page after page after page. And of course, Thai was not my native language, and memorization was not my forte. So I figured what I could, needed to do was find two or three surefire quotes that would be applicable in any situation, any topic. And this is one of them. The self is its own mainstay. Whatever you do, you're going to have to depend on yourself, and you have to train yourself to be dependable. That's where we get back to heedfulness, the reminder that we have to think in the long term. You can't just be satisfied with short term. The Buddha defines that as part of the definition of discernment as well. You're wise to the extent that you want to know what to do or say or think that would lead to long term happiness. This principle is so basic that many of these principles of the healthy self are the things that the Buddha taught to his son when Merhula, the son, was only seven years old. 
He starts out by saying, before you do something, ask yourself, this thing that I've been planning to do, whether it's an act in the body, speech, or mind, but harm myself, will it harm others? Okay, that's heedfulness right there, plus compassion. You don't want to harm anybody. And then as you, if you see that it will harm somebody, you don't do it. That's restraint. So the three really the principles right there, right in the very beginning. And if you see that there's going to be no harm or you don't foresee any harm, then you go ahead and do it. But even while you're doing it, you look at what actually is coming out in the course of your action as the results. This is the principle of being responsible. Again, that goes from heedfulness. You don't just depend on good intentions. You really want to make sure that your intentions are actually skillful. So that builds on heedfulness. You have a sense of responsibility. If you see there's any harm, you stop. If you don't first see, don't see any harm coming up, you can continue. When the action is done, you look at the long-term consequences, and if you see that there was some unexpected harm that actually happened, you go talk it over with someone else who's more advanced on the path. And then you develop a sense of shame around that action. In other words, you realize it's beneath you. This is, again, this is a healthy sense of self, the opposite of shamelessness. But if you see that there was nothing that, in any way that you caused any harm, you said, take joy in that fact that you're advancing on the training. Okay, this is the sublimation. Learn how to take joy in being skillful. Instead of enjoying just indulging in your whims, doing what you want, learn to appreciate life as a skill and that you're appreciating the skill that you're developing. There's a very deep sense of happiness that comes when you realize that you've done something skillful, much deeper than simply enjoying nice sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. So from the very beginning, the Buddha was teaching his son almost all of those principles of a healthy sense of self. So there's nothing lacking in the Buddha's teachings. It's simply learning how to understand them and to apply the right teaching at the right time. Eventually you will get <clears throat> you will let go of your sense of self, but only when it's done everything you need it to do. It's part of your strategy for finding true happiness. You're learning how to train it so it finds a happiness that really is generally true, generally reliable. So reliable that you don't have to do anything to maintain it. That's when you don't need the strategies anymore. Either the strategies of self or the strategies of not self. But in the meantime, learn how to develop a healthy sense of self that will maintain you on the path. It will guarantee that you're headed in the right direction, a happiness that really is solid. <clears throat>